The scripture verse for today is found in John 13, verses 1 through 17, and this is going along with our John uh, home group Bible studies that we're having, and this is lesson number 9 or 10? 9! Is it 9 or 10? I don't know. It's 9 or 10. So, let's read together, shall we? It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prepared Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothings, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, uh, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. And Peter said, no, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who, who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place, do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is who I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. To tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word this day. Now travel back with me, if you will, to a time right around 30 A.D. The place, Jerusalem. The time, the night before crucifixion before Christ's crucifixion, evening. The cast, Jesus and the 12 disciples, and the setting, the upper room. You see, as Jesus wrapped up his work here on earth, he held a dinner for his closest associates. And instead of delivering a State of the Union address or, or maybe naming his successor, Jesus chose to leave his seat at the head of the table and pick up a basin of water and a towel. According to Pastor Richard Tao, earlier Peter and John had been sent by Jesus to prepare this meal, and everything was ready. The food was ready. The food had been cooked the table had already been set. And as the disciples entered the room, they see over in the corner the towel and the basin of water. And they don't see the slave who is to come over and wash their feet as they enter the room. And that was a very demeaning task. But it was necessary because when people traveled 2,000 years ago, they wore sandals. And they did most of their travel by walking. And they walked along these trails. And these trails were dusty. They were dirty. And they were cluttered with camel dung and donkey dung and all kinds of stuff. So when guests arrived in your home, they had more than just dust on their feet. And it was a common courtesy for the host to, to have his slave or his servant wash the guest's feet as they entered the house. 
And perhaps when the disciples entered that room on that night, they wondered, where was this servant? Maybe, uh, maybe they wondered if Peter and John might have forgotten this little detail. And as they recline at the table, each disciple is thinking his own thoughts, thinking maybe, you know, somebody ought to at least wash Jesus' feet. But, you know, if I volunteer to do it, I might get stuck with doing it for life. And maybe if I just wait, somebody else is going to do it. Now, if, you have, if you've been attending church for more than a week, you know that this kind of thinking happens a lot. <laughs> somebody needs to help out in the nursery. But that's not my ministry. Somebody else needs to help with Sunday breakfast because I can't wake up that early. And we know that's true. And I think maybe each disciple was hoping one of the others would volunteer. Each one was trying to justify in their own mind why, why it wasn't his job to do it. Well, you know what? I did it last time. I think it's Matthew's turn. He hasn't done it for a while. <laughs> and one of those guys ought to take care of it. Maybe Peter and John were supposed to take care of it. And Jesus told them to do it, but they just didn't feel like it. Maybe somebody thought, well, I came to enjoy some time with the Lord, and I don't want to be accused of working myself to death like that Martha girl. <laughs> we don't know what they were thinking, but we do know that nobody, nobody rose to this occasion. Verses 4 and 5, it says this. So he got up from the meal, from the meal, he took off his outer clothing and, str and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He, who, who are we referring to here? Jesus himself got up, took off his outer garment, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into the basin, and began to wash. And I think that maybe a few jaws dropped on the ground. You know, rather than hearing a lecture or maybe a parable or maybe even a prayer, Jesus showed them by example. And I've learned something about ministry. People would much rather be shown how to do something rather than to be told <laughs> what they're doing wrong. Because if, if we can see it done correctly, sometimes we listen, sometimes we watch, sometimes we learn. And here was a need, and everybody at the table saw what the need was. It was hard not to. And Jesus himself met the need. He took the appropriate action. Action. I know we've talked about this from the pulpit before, but action and the action words are found in verses 4 and 5. Listen to this. Number one, he got up for, from the meal. He left his comfort zone. He made his body do something it may not have wanted to do. You know, my alarm went off about 7.15 this morning, and my body did not want to get up. I know you're all shocked. But after a few hits on the snooze alarm button, my body finally got up. <laughs> to be a servant, first, you have to get up. Action verb. He got up. Action. He took off his outer clothing. To serve others, we usually have to lay something aside. I know that we're all busy people. <laughs> I get that. And if I see a need and I have to add something to my schedule that was not unexpected, I usually have to subtract something from my schedule that I had planned. <laughs> Every servant has to deny himself to have the time and the energy to give to other people. Number three, he wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin. You see, he was making preparations. He was doing, making preparations to meet the need. And then number four, he began. 
I like that. At some point, we have to begin. We can think about it. We can pray about it. We can prepare for it. But at some point, we have to start doing. You know, we prayed about this building. <laughs> we had meeting after meeting, just talking about the structure that we are now sitting in today. And many of the local townspeople said it couldn't be done. And you know what? Without God as the captain of this ship, it couldn't have been done. Amen? But in 2014, something began to happen. And instead of talking about it and praying about it and meeting about it, we began. We started acting. And in a ceremony that involved hundreds of people and each one carrying a shovel, how many of you were here that day? when we broke ground for this place. Amen. The first holes were dug. Maybe some of the, the holes were dug right about where you're sitting. And instead of talking about it, we started acting on it. You see, at some point, you have to begin. You have to start doing it. And Jesus begins, and he starts to wash his disciples' feet. And in verse 6, he comes to Peter, super impetuous, ready, shoot, aim, Peter. <laughs> and Peter says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answers, well, I know you don't get it yet, Peter, but someday you will. And Peter says, oh, no, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus says, eh, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. And then Peter said the strangest thing. It was so off the wall. He says this, because he thought maybe he had a better idea. And he says, well, if you're going to wash my feet, don't just stop there. <laughs> wash my hands, wash my head as well. It took Peter a while to learn that none of us has a better idea than Jesus himself. Not one of us has a better idea. The best thing we can possibly do is to simply hear what Jesus tells us to do and do it. <laughs> and do it now. I heard about a man who always had trouble getting his son to clean his room. And the boy would always say, yeah, I'll do that, Dad. But rarely would he follow through. Well, after high school, the son joined the Marine Corps. I think his name was Bradley. <laughs> Is that right, Deb? But when he came home from leave from basic training, his dad asked him, what have you learned in these past few months? And he answered, Dad, I have learned what now means. <laughs> and Peter, Peter eventually learned to simply obey the Lord. And to do it now, rather than to, to offer perhaps what would be a better idea. Maybe that's something we all need to learn. Maybe we all need to go to boot camp. What do you think? <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah, me neither, Carrie. And then there was Judas. He got to Judas. And here sits Judas in this circle of followers. Judas, who was full of deceit, full of hypocrisy moments away from stabbing Jesus in the back and, and Jesus knew it huh. so how does Christ react when he gets to Judas he doesn't distance himself from Judas he doesn't point his figure finger at him and, and say to him how dare you after all I've done for you instead he loves him to the end he does everything possible to bring Judas to repentance. He washes his feet the same tenderness, the same affection, the same love that he gave his other disciples. Maybe that would soften Judas' heart. But it doesn't. I'm sure that Judas turned his head away as Jesus gazed so lovingly into his eyes. 
In verse 10, Jesus says that not all are clean, giving Judas yet another opportunity to repent. But instead of repenting, good old Judas, he hardens his heart. So here's Jesus in the upper room the night before he literally left this world. Here he is in this room having one last precious moment with his disciples, teaching them unconditional love, teaching them humility, teaching them what mercy looks like, teaching them what sacrifice is all about. And he's doing it on a one-on-one -on -one from him to his disciples setting. He's taking the time to prepare them for what was ahead, the humiliation of the cross, his ultimate expression. And that's what that was for all of us. Greater love has no man that he lay down his life for his friends is found in John 15, 13. And that's what Jesus did for you and for me. After Jesus finished washing the feet, he asked this question in verse 11. Do you even understand what I've done for you? He's asking him, has this significance even sunk, soaked in yet? Because it goes way beyond just getting your feet washed. It goes way beyond getting your need met. Jesus comes into our lives, and he loves us. He receives us. He meets us in our need. And sometimes people think that's what it's all about, getting my need met, getting my feet washed, praying my prayers to God and getting my will done. But that's not it. It's about a personal transformation of character. It's about a personal transformation or change of the way we think. It's about becoming a servant like Jesus. Verse 15 says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you because freely you have received and now freely give. If my experience in God is only about me, only about me getting my needs met, then I've missed something along the way. If church is about me and getting what I need, getting what I want, then I have missed something. The greatest human tragedy is for a person to never receive Christ, never to receive his mercy. Christ came down to you right now and stood right here face to face with you and said this to you. If I give you all the riches in the world, if I give you all the popularity in the world, if I give you everything that you want in this world, but the exchange is that you will never again know my love or see my face, would you do it? Did you feel that in your heart? Did you feel that in your heart? Getting everything that you want, getting everything that you ever dreamed about, all the money in the world, all these things that we crave. <laughs> and then he adds the zinger, but you will never see my face or hear my voice again. Would you do it? That feeling when I said that, that's the Holy Spirit alive in you. That's the Holy Spirit saying, give me all the riches or none. Make me a pauper or make me a king, but I will do it in your help and with your strength. We can't do it apart from Christ. That feeling that you had is such an awakening for each one of us, how much we need him and how much we depend on him, how much we truly love him. So the greatest human tragedy is for a person to have never even met him in the first place. But the second greatest tragedy is that a, per a person would have met him and accepted him and experienced his love and experienced his grace and experienced the warm fuzzies, but never translate that into service towards others. 
The second greatest tragedy is that a person receives Christ and experiences him in the love that he gives and his grace, but never serves him. You see, there is a deepened relationship that happens with God, and it's only found when you serve other people because it is truly, and like Scott would say, Jesus, Jesus wasn't woofing when he said, it is truly more blessed to give than to receive. He who loses his life in service to others is the one who is going to find it. There was a, a wealthy American traveler that tells the story of how he was visiting a hospital in Southeast Asia, and he entered into a room just as a young missionary nurse was cleaning the sores of a sick, filthy, dirty, elderly man who had been lying in a gutter. And the wealthy man said to the nurse, oh my goodness, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And the nurse looked at him and said, neither would I. You see, servanthood has a price tag. And Jesus wants us to learn to wash one another's feet. And doing so means to humble yourselves, to get down where the need is, and you do something, and to do something about it. We have so many wonderful examples of that right here in this church, of people serving, getting dirty, some of them. You know, like the, our breakfast crew, Bob and Tim and Debbie and Lydia and Jean and Chris, who go back there every Sunday and do breakfast for us. Getting dirty, serving others. There's Bob, or there's um, Jim and Jeff and others that tear down and set up this, this place every Sunday morning. There's a couple I know that's painting the inside of this church, and I know they wouldn't want their names mentioned, so I won't. You're welcome, Dick and Denise. <laughs> <laughs> But this list goes on and on and on. And I can't, I can't even begin to name all of the foot washers in this congregation. And I don't know them all, but guess what? God does. And really, he's the only one that matters, isn't he? There are many, many practical needs all around us. And foot washers are the ones who see the need and they do something about it. Verse 17 says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. It's so important to just do it. It's a whole lot easier to talk about service, to think about service, to fantasize, I'm sure, about service, to hear sermons about service. So much easier to do all those things than to actually do service for others, but... The blessing, the joy, the happiness is not found in talking about it or hearing about it. It's found when you actually do it. Many of you and all of us now have heard about last Sunday's efforts, collecting for the Super Bowl Sunday for the food pantry, collecting 250 cans of food, giving a total now of $1,200, because the mission team matched the monies that we gave, so we were able to give $1,200 to the food pantry. Again, thank you. And the people in this community thank you. The people thank the foot washers from this church. And let's keep that spirit of giving alive. Is there a need that you can meet? Is there someone near you who needs his or her feet washed? some practical service that could make that person's burden perhaps a little bit lighter. And we ask that the Lord would open our eyes to the dirty feet all around us and give us a heart to wash them. Praise him. Come on up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we are a congregation on the move. We thank you for the blessing that you gave us through last Sunday for the money that came in, for all the food that came in, Lord, 
to help others in need. Help us, Father, to continue to be foot washers right here in Conneaut, Ohio, right here in this church when we see a need arise. Help us not just to think about it and pray about it and decide to do it. Father, again, we ask that you help us to simply do it and do it now. And we pray this to our God, the Father of all and creator of everything. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now as our